Yeah, good morning, class. Yeah, I hope you are doing well. This is the fourth lecture on a row. And this morning, we want to look at the ball radius. We are still in the COVID season, and um, as responsible Ghanaians, we would want to entreat you to abide by all the safety protocols spelled out by the WHO and then that of our government so that we'll be able to conquer COVID-19. In the last lecture, we tried to look at the hydrogen spectra or the spectral lines of the hydrogen. In the lesson, we saw that in an atom, an electron could fall from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. And that comes with emission of sun radiations, which may fall within the ultraviolet and then the infrared regions. And so we came to understand that when an electron falls from a higher energy level to energy level one, um, we describe that as the, the Lehman series. We had a similar situation of an electron falling from a higher energy level to energy level two, and we describe that as the Bauman series. Many others came. And so this morning, the interest is actually to look at the ball radius of the hydrogen atom. And so our lesson will be guided by the following objectives. Now, by the end of the lesson, you will be able to, one, define the ball radius. You should be able to define the ball radius. Secondly, you should be able to derive the ball radius for the hydrogen atom. This involves a little bit of calculation. And so uh, I treat all of us to be you know, up and doing. Again, I explain the essence of the ball radius and look at some calculations involving the ball radius for named atoms or ions named atoms or ions. Good. Now recall that, as I said, we looked at the hydrogen spectra in which we saw that with the hydrogen atom, it has a series of spectral lines in the infrared and then the ultraviolet regions. And so on your screen, you have the various transitions from high energy level to the ground state, which is energy level one, uh, energy level two, energy level three, and four and five, and various names have been assigned to these transitions. Now, it's important that we go through the process again and so on your screen again, you see the electron transition for the hydrogen atom. When an electron falls from energy level two, level three, level four, level five, level six, level seven to level one, it is described as the Lehman series. Okay? Described as the Lehman series. So if you have an atom in which the electron is in the seventh energy level, sixth energy level, fifth energy level, fourth energy level, third energy level, second energy level. If all these energy levels have electrons falling from each of them to energy level one, we we'll describe that you know um, emission to be Lehman, or we'll describe it as Lehman series. On the other hand, if it falls from a higher energy level to energy level two, then we'll describe that as the Bauman series. And so the instance here is that we have an electron falling from level three to level two, level four to level two, level five to level two, 
level 6 to level 2, level 7 to level 2, and these falls are called Bama series. The partial series occurs when an electron falls from energy levels of higher value than you know, 3, and so they fall to 3. From 4 to 3, 5 to 3, 6 to 3, 7 to 3, that gives us the passion series. And so on and so forth. So this force, I mean the last on the screen, which is not the least though, a bracket series, we have a fall from energy level, let's say 5 to 4, 6 to 4, and 7 to 4. Now, we also said that supposing the electron you know, jumps from, let's say, energy level 1 to energy level 2, that would be as a result of uh, an electron giving some energy, so it's excited and goes up to a higher energy level. And that comes with absorption of, you know, how do you call it, uh, some energy. And so the absorption of hydrogen atom has this, you know, uh, spectra, you know, lines or colors when an electron jumps from a lower level to a higher level, you have an absorption of some energy, and this for the hydrogen atom is a callus. Now, when the fall occurs, or when the transition is from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, as we have in the Lehman, Bauman, Poisson, and then the Bracket series, and the Poufan series, then that comes with emission of radiation and those emissions are what I describe as maybe some could be infrared and some could be ultraviolet and so the color you see here is the emission of the hydrogen atom or the emission spectrum of the hydrogen atom. We still recall that Bohr from 1912 to 1913 suggested that the electrons in an atom orbit the positively charged nucleus in a similar way to planets orbiting the sun. So the ball made us aware that the solar system comes in this form where we have the sun at the central point and the sun is surrounded by some planets. So for instance this one of the rings or the orbits two, three. And so the first one we know mine, very ice. And so these are the planets for just the first three planets. And so according to the solar system model, um, we have the sun at the central point and around the sun is or are the various uh, planets. Now, Nebo's model of the atom has a central point as well, which we may call the positive you know, part of the atom. And so maybe some P, or the same as a Z, um, that's the atomic number. And so around this, uh, the various shells or energy level for which we agree that electrons would also be contained in this shell, and so on and so forth. And so for the hydrogen atom of Nebor, we may have a similar drawing as the central part, which is the hydrogen with protons, then the first shell, which is energy level one, has one electron. So that if you compare the planetary, uh, that's the solar system, okay? Solar system with the boss model of the atom, or boss planetary model of the atom, um, atomic model. then one can say that the sun is likened to the positive nucleus here. The orbits 
uh, the energy levels that we have, and perhaps the various planets are also likened to the electrons. Okay? Now, one very important thing is that with the uh, solar system, we are told that the planets are kept in orbit by gravitational force. Gravitational rotational force keeps planets in orbit by providing a centripetal force by providing a centripetal force a centripetal force. So these planets we see orbiting the sun are kept in this orbit as a result of gravitational force which is providing a centripetal force. Now with the Bohr's model, this electron is negatively charged and the nucleus, which is the positively charged, you know, adequate region of the atom, have this kind of interaction, uh, which we we'll say maybe attraction. Okay, there's an attraction between the P and then the E, and this particular type of attraction is called electrostatic force of attraction. So. What is keeping the electron in orbit is the electro, electrostatic force. And this electrostatic force is also providing the centripetal force. So in the Bohr's model of the atom, electrostatic force provides centripetal force to keep the electron in orbit, orbit. Now let's try to do some small mathematics here. Under the solar system model, we are saying gravitational force keeps planets in orbit, okay? And our gravitational force we know is given by F gravitational is the gravitational constant, mass of perhaps the sun, mass of any of the planets. So let's say Mercury or Earth. We use Earth because it's on Earth. Then the distance between the planets and then the the sun, so mass of sun, and then mass of earth, and then divided by the radius or the distance between the two bodies uh, squared. So it is this particular force, okay, that is providing the centripetal force here. In the case of the Bohr model, we are looking at electrostatic force, which when we look at the Coulomb's law, okay, Coulomb said that the force of attraction or repulsion between two charged bodies, okay, is directly proportional to the product of their charges, okay, and inversely proportional to the square of the distances between them. So. That means that we can write F for Coulomb is the same as some constant, some charge 1, charge 2 over R squared. So basically we can say that that centripetal force is also provided by the electrostatic force. 
And so if you look at or compare the two models, then you see that the gravitational force in the planetary, you know, the solar system is the same as that Coulombic force that we have existing between the electron and then the proton. So this is the same as this, okay? Because they are all forces. Now, we are saying that in the solar system, the gravitational force provides centripetal force. So centripetal force is the mass of the body multiplied by the centripetal acceleration. So V squared over R. And similar thing can be seen here. This is also M V squared over R because that's what the two statements are saying. In the solar system, gravitational force keeps planets in orbit by providing a centripetal force. In the atomic model, the electrostatic force provides centripetal force to keep the electrons in orbit. So, ladies and gentlemen, Bohr's model of the atom simply is a prototype of the solar system. Okay, it is yes, you know, similar to the solar system. The difference is basically the fact that with the solar system, the planets are in orbit because of the force of gravity providing centripetal force. In the model of the atom, the force, which we call the electrostatic force, is what is keeping the electrons in orbit and providing the centripetal force. Now let's look at the centripetal force itself. The force is supposed to be something that draws objects towards the center of a circle in which they are moving. And so ideally, if you have a system like this with a central part where the protons are and then the electrons are here, and we are saying that the force of attraction between the two bodies is coming from the electrostatic, this is electrostatic, okay? And at the same time, we are also saying that the force moving the body towards the center of the circle is also centimeter. Then it looks like the two forces are acting in the same direction. Okay, so ideally it doesn't make sense to say the centripetal force and then the electrostatic force that balance to keep the uh, you know the electron in orbit and so we usually would want to talk about uh, a fictitious force which we call centrifugal okay centrifugal force is actually a force opposite to centripetal it doesn't exist anyway but i mean to make our argument valid then we need a force that will be pulling this out and then one that will be pulling this one in. So that when the two forces are balanced, then the electron will remain in orbit. So on this slide, we have learned a lot of things, okay, including the solar system and the fact that the planets are in orbit because of gravitational force that is providing, you know, the centripetal force, which now I've just explained to you that it's rather the centrifugal force, which we might talk about, but then it is fictitious, so we just, you know, talk about it in the sense of centripetal force. Let's make progress. Now, assuming I put the solar system aside, because that is not our focus, we are supposed to be dealing with the ball model. We want to calculate the ball radius. And so if we draw this one and we have the nucleus here, okay? This is supposed to be the path of the electron. The proton is here. We can represent it with the ZE, okay? 
can represent with it. So to give us that kind of feeling that the charge on the electron E is supposed to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And that on a proton, the ZE. Okay? Proton will give you ZE because Z is equal to 1. And that's it. And so if I write this, this one will be 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. Now this is electron, so it's negative. And the proton, which is P, is supposed to be positive. You see the same charge. That's why in an, a neutral atom, um, I mean, in an atom, when the number of electrons are equal to the number of protons, we say we have a neutral atom. So now, I want to use ZE as my proton and use the E as the electron. So that from the Coulomb's law, I write F centipeter can be some K value. One of the charges is E, the other one is also E, okay, but it's ZE. And I'm using this advisedly because I have told you that the ZE is representing the, the proton, okay? And so that's it. <clears throat> now, the E here is the electron, so now I've put minus here to represent that of the electron. And so divided by the R square, which is the distance between this and this, which is R, okay? So Coulomb's law, is represented by this, which we can simplify to be Fc, so minus k, maybe Ze squared over r squared. Okay? And we are assuming that uh, Z is 1, because we are dealing with the hydrogen atom. Now, fast forward, we also recall that K is supposed to be 1 out of 4 pi epsilon naught. Okay, that's when we are not giving the value of K. Okay, and we know of the permittivity of free space. Then we can calculate for the value of K. And so based on that, we can now put the Coulomb's law, that electrostatic force to be Z e squared minus over 4 pi epsilon naught and r squared. So this is the electrostatic force for the hydrogen atom, I mean the electron in the hydrogen atom, the balance between the um, electron and then the, the proton. The force is minus z e squared we are 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. And that is very, very important. Now, in your shot, you also see that, you know, representation of the electron, okay, having some tangential velocity and the force, okay, could be the Coulombic force towards the center or it could be the centripetal force and that's what we're talking about so this f c that i've written here okay which is minus z e squared over four pi epsilon naught r squared is supposed to be equal to that centrifugal force in which case i'm saying is centripetal so that will be also, m v squared over the r. We can negate this. When we negate it, it only tells us that that is the centrifugal force opposite to the centimeter. And then the two negatives will cancel, and you can have that relation. So let's keep this in mind. As we go, uh, you know, I had to look at the ball radius. These things will play a very important rule.
Now we are interested in also looking at the potential energy of the electron. Okay? The potential energy of the electron. And on your screen you see the potential energy given as minus z e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r. Now let's find out how this came into existence. Because it actually started by saying that the potential energy is q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught r. Or Z e times into bracket minus e over 4 pi epsilon naught. Let's look at how it came about. Potential energy is actually work done, all right? And so if we agree that work done, the work done is the same as the potential energy u, all right? Then we know from basic mechanics that work done is supposed to be force multiplied by the displacement. In this case, I would like to use R for the displacement to make things simpler for us. Okay? So this is the work done, which is the same as the potential energy. Um, F dot R is actually a dot product. Okay, not cross one. And so, if I put this here, then that force I'm talking about here is the Coulombic force. Okay? The Coulombic force which I have on the body. And so, I can simply write this as, you know, if we were to write um, charges as Q1, Q2, then this minus Ke and then the, um, the Ze here, we can only write K and put Q1, Q2 over R squared. I multiply this by R. Now you all agree with me that this R will cancel this. So essentially you are going to get K, Q1, Q2 over the R. So this is the energy or the work done, potential energy. I would mean. Good. Now if we liken one of the Q's to, you know, the proton, and liking the other Q to the electron, then this can also be written as K, E, and then the Z, E, okay, over the R. And here, because one of the E's is negative, we can just put it there, negative. And so, if you simplify this one, then you get the K, Z e squared on R on R which is negative okay don't forget your negative sign the negative and so once we've done that I will know the value of K K can now give us 1 over 4 we know that K is supposed to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught so put this one into this formula, then your u will be equal to the z e squared minus over 4 pi epsilon naught and then the r. So this is our potential energy, okay? As you see on your shot, is the potential energy. U equals q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught r giving us minus z e squared over 4 pi epsilon dot r. That's because we have said that q1 can be the proton and q2 can be the electron. Let's make progress. We want to define the ball radius, okay? Because that's what we are interested in. Now the ball radius symbolize a naught is a fiscal constant equal to the most probable distance between the nucleus and the electron in the hydrogen atom in its ground state. Take note. We are saying that the ball radius is a fiscal constant equal to the most probable distance between the nucleus and the electron in hydrogen atom in its ground state. And so the numerical value of 
the ball radius in SI unit is 5.29 times 10 to the power minus 11 meters. Now, take note. This figure, 5.29 times 10 to the power minus 11 meters, which is the ball radius, so A naught is this value, can be written as 0 0.529 times 10 to the power minus 10 meters. Now, I'm interested in the minus 10 meters because that is called unstrong. Okay, 10 to the power minus 10 is unstrong. Okay, so take note, 10 to the power minus 10 meters is called the unstrong, which means the ball radius is supposed to be 0 0.529 unstrong. And that's one day we shall quiz you on that. Now the symbols used for the ball radius include AO or A naught. Okay, we prefer to say A naught. R naught, the you know, subscripts, and then the R. So either use A naught, R naught, or the R to represent the ball radius in all the calculations that we'll be doing. So far, we have dealt with knowing the force of attraction that exists between the nucleus and the electron, okay? That's electrostatic force, and the electrons are in orbit as a result of the centripetal force provided by the electrostatic force. We've also seen the potential energy of that electron, okay? The force is this one, and then the potential energy is this one. So that in attempting to find the ball radius of the atom, we would first and foremost look at the force and proceed with the potential energy the next thing we would like to look at the kinetic energy and perhaps we look at the angular momentum. Four basic things and that will give us the clear path to calculating or finding the ball radius. Now the failure of classical model of the atom. You remember that in one of the discussions we said that Bohr's model of the atom actually failed classical physics. The reason is that we know that when atoms, okay, or electrons or, um, you know, bodies, I mean, per the classical physics, when bodies are moving, they expend energy. And once they are expending energy, the energy will finish along the way. So when the energy finishes, the bodies will ground to a halt. So we are expecting that in the issue of the, um, the atom, where the electron is also moving in orbit. The electron will be using some energy to move around the central part of it, that's the nucleus. And so after a while, these electrons will lose energy and they will fall. They will crash into the nucleus. But in the model of the atom proposed by Nebor, that did not happen which means it doesn't conform to classical physics. And so what we can see is that the orbiting electron is an accelerating charge. Accelerating charge emits electromagnetic wave and therefore lose energy. And that classical physics predicts electron should spiral into the nucleus emitting continuous spectrum of radiation and the atom will collapse. But this, like I said, is not the case. Otherwise, you and I would not even be alive because our bodies are made up of several atoms and electrons revolving in these atoms would certainly lose energy if it were to be obey the classical you know, physics approach. And so classical physics can't give us stable atoms, okay? 
if we go by that, classical physics will not give us stable atom. Now I want to end the lesson um, halfway so that in the next lesson we will look at how to derive the, um, the Bohr model. But then what we need to know is that, one, we have talked about the fact that to find the Bohr radius, first you need to know why the electrons are still in orbit. And for that matter, we said electrostatic force provides the centripetal force. That has been done. We have also mentioned the fact that for electron in orbit, it is doing some work or some work has been done on it. And so that work can be described as the potential energy, which we also saw in the, um, how do you call it, in the diagram. The Bohr model makes it possible to relate the centripetal force of electron to its kinetic energy as well. So in the next lesson, we'll be looking at how the centripetal force, which we have already stated as centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r, and that is equal to the kinetic energy sort. So how would we make this mv squared over r look like half mv squared or mv squared over 2. How are we going to make it look like that? And we'll do that in our next lesson. Um, enjoy the rest of the day, and I'll meet you at the flip side. And um, uh, please make sure that you observe all the safety protocols. Wear your marks, OK? I have mine here. Right after this, I'll put it on. And please sanitize your hands as well and make sure that you keep social distance. Have a nice day and see you.